and even the BBC gets it wrong. I've had to wait 20 minutes for them to get theirs right. So we're going live now. Deborah, go ahead. So, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. Fantastic that you're here. Um, just to say, you may see that there are two Lucy Winkets featured on the screen here. Um, the one with the collar is the real deal. Um, and my name is Deborah Colvin, and I'm privileged to be church warden and sustainability champion of this hopeful manifestation of church known as St. James's Piccadilly. So a really warm welcome to all of you to this event, Living into a Hope-Filled Tomorrow. I've personally long been interested in dialogue between those who see the world through the lens of faith and those whose formative lens is largely scientific and being convinced that a key point of convergence of these ways of being is in the arena of environment and conservation. So I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting this conservation, this conversation even, between Dr. Jane Goodall and Reverend Lucy Winkett, two really wise and humane voices speaking out of areas of commitment and experience that don't always sit in dialogue at the same table or even in the same Zoom room. Both Jane and Lucy give their lives to their work through their respective organizations, the Jane Goodall Institute and St. James's Church Piccadilly. Both have really suffered an acute loss of income in recent months. So if you haven't already, please do make a donation through the Eventbrite link, which will keep on popping up in the chat during the course of this event. All donations will be split 50-50 between the two organizations. And speaking of the chat function, please do add your comments and questions as we go along. We won't have much time for individual questions, but we will monitor the chat and hopefully feed through some of the themes that you raise into the conversation. So let me introduce our speakers. Last week, Jane celebrated the 60th anniversary of her arrival to study chimpanzees at Gombe in Tanzania. It's no exaggeration to say that this work fundamentally changed a scientific paradigm and quite literally challenged our concept of what it is to be human. Through her observations of tool use in chimpanzees, Jane demonstrated that the difference between chimps and humans is one of degree, not of kind. This opened the eyes of the Western scientific world to the realization that we are a part of nature, not outside it. Jane is also an activist on a global scale. As a campaigner, she's ushered in another revolution by supporting local people to take charge of the conservation and development of their own communities and thereby helping the chimpanzees who they live alongside. Among the many accolades she has received in her long life are UN Ambassador of Peace and Sister of Mother Earth. Jane is well known for her assertion that if you want to change people's minds, you have first to change their hearts. So a really warm welcome to Jane. We know you're no stranger to this church, having spoken here before. And in fact, your mother's memorial was, was held here some years ago. So earlier this month, Lucy celebrated 25 years since her ordination as a priest in the Church of England, a member of the first generation of women priests. Before arriving at St. James's, Lucy was canon presenter at St. Paul's Cathedral. It's no exaggeration to say that the ordination of women to the priesthood has been a game changer for the Church of England, not least, as Lucy might say, because the goals of theology itself change when they're explored by women. We're privileged that Lucy has been generating and exploring these goals in the context of this community as our rector since 2010. As a public theologian, Lucy writes and broadcasts widely on culture, music, gender, and religion. She's written recently that our resolute and resilient hope 
is that things do not have to be as they are and that change in the spirit is possible. So welcome Lucy sitting in front of our beautiful Grinling Gibbons in the altar in the church. So to start us off, can I ask each of you just to share a brief story or anecdote about our theme, uh, living into a hope filled tomorrow, perhaps something that's happened in this time of anniversary for you both, um, something that's sitting with you this week that you might bring to the conversation. And we've tossed a coin and Lucy's going to start. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Deborah. Um, so I, I was wondering whether I just might tell a very short anecdote. It's, it's very domestic, it's very prosaic in a way, but I think that says something in itself about my lunch today. So I had some hummus for lunch and I didn't really notice until I'd had about half of it that it said on the label that it had been made from imperfect vegetables, which I thought was really fantastic and made me think three things immediately. One is that uh, perfect and imperfect is a human imposition on the natural world, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And so I was delighted that they were imperfect. The second thing I thought immediately was that the kind of quest for perfection is often something attached to religion. And it's very often very damaging for all sorts of people. Uh, and so I, I try to avoid it, try to avoid even wanting it or desiring it. Um, and the third thing it made me think was a little bit more economic, I suppose, which is that if you're making hummus and you want to sell hummus to people, then you might try to please them. And it heartened me that more people might buy the hummus because they were, it was made out of imperfect vegetables. And I thought that that might be a, a kind of a moment where we as human beings are recognizing that those previous constructs and impositions on the natural world are just not very, they're more, they're more than not helpful. They're damaging, not only to us, but to the environment in which we live. So um, it was just my imperfect vegetables today. I thought we're moving in the right direction and it oddly gave me hope. And then I ate it. Thank you, Lucy. Jane, what about you? <laughs> I think you're muted, Jane. Um, <clears throat> I have been dicing and dithering between two stories, but um, I think I'll choose the one where I got an email just yesterday from one of those people who are just the most incredible people I know. And this is somebody called Chris Koch, he's Canadian. And uh, he was born with no arms and no legs. He had little stumps about this, this long, but they weren't like an, a, a stump of an arm. It was like a, as thin as a wrist. And on the end of one of the stumps was a little tiny, tiny protuberance. Maybe it was meant to be a thumb. And coming out of one thigh is what looks like a flipper, but maybe originally it was a foot. And that's the way he was born, if not thalidomide or anything like that. And I've met him now several times. And he, he, he'll, he rides, goes around on a skateboard. He flips off with this little flipper foot and comes into the room. And of course, he's down there and I was standing up to greet him. And it felt a little strange the last time I met him or the first time I met him. And... Uh, I said, shall I come and sit on the floor? He said, no, no, I'll sit on the sofa with you. So he gave a big push with one, with, with this flipper and sat on the sofa. Now, I'm now looking directly into the eyes of someone who is so brimming with vitality, with life, with, with, with the love of life, uh, with intelligence, with everything that his body wasn't. And so we talked and he was telling me what he does and that he's been all around Europe on a skateboard and how he, he drove this, this, I don't know, so many million dollar, I mean, thousand dollar worth tractor. And his friend said, are you sure you can drive it? Yes, I can drive it. It's amazing what he can do with these two little stumps. And then at the end of this conversation, I said to him, well, uh, have people offered you prosthetics, arms or legs? 
And he said, yes, they have, but you know, I think maybe I was put together in this way for some reason. I think I'll stay the way I am. And then after a pause, he said, but maybe I'll take them up on their offer for prosthetics when I climb Mount Everest. That to me is a sign of the indomitable human spirit. And it's the indomitable human spirit that is one of my great reasons for hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. So you, you talk about spirit a lot, Jane, and Lucy, um, you talk about hearts and minds and spirit, both, both of you. Um, I wonder if we could explore a little bit about um, encouragement and aspiration for, for change of heart and mind and spirit in, in all of us. Um, could you say a little bit more about that and perhaps, perhaps respond to each other's thoughts on that? Lucy, I think it's your turn next. <laughs> You're muted, Lucy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I think that word indomitable, Jane, that, that I, I really relate to that. I think that for me, if, we, if, we're talk, if we're exploring this whole area of hope, then it's really important to, gr to ground it because it can sound very, it can sound very kind of overarching and rather difficult to reach. Um, and it, it can sound a little bit kind of heady, but actually most of the decisions, I think that most of the decisions we make as individuals for, for change happen, not even in our heart, I would say in our gut, it's at some really visceral level. And then quite often we, it, it kind of seeps, it seeps up maybe, it seeps out, and then we find some reasons or we find some ways to, to make sense of it. But, um, that to me argues for a, uh, for us, I mean, I would use the language of the, of the spiritual, a, a spiritual hope that underpins all of our um, physical behavior and decision-making that we, that we do every day. And so there's something, there's something mysterious, I suppose, I would also want to say about, about hope um, and, and trying to cultivate that hope in yourself is, I mean, you just can't do it, you can't do it alone. You do have to look into the eyes of another person or another creature for that to be, uh, for that to be grown and for, for you to be able to make change together. So I think sometimes we think, we, we convince ourselves that we can l almost legislate our way, you know, a as people to, uh, to a hopeful future, but actually that, that only comes down the track that hearts and minds and spirit is where it seems to start for me anyway. I don't know how you, how you feel about that. Well, I've sort of got two, two, um, two different prongs to what we're talking about now. And one is about hope. And my sort of job, I mean, the last four books I wrote all have hope in the title. Almost all the talks I've been giving, because I used to be traveling 300 days a year around the world until lockdown. Now I'm at home. Behind me are the books I read as a child, well, some of them. And um, so I'm, I, I was lucky. I was caught here in my family home in UK. I nearly was caught in Abu Dhabi. And it's much better to be here. So um, hope, why is hope so important? Because we're living in very dark times and politically and socially and environmentally it, it, they are very very dark times we we'll would go into that now but i think everybody knows that and somehow this pandemic has, has has really helped people think more about that and so living in these very dark times many people have lost hope and you can't blame them and they're told think globally act locally but honestly if you think globally you don't have the you're so depressed, you cannot act locally because you haven't got any energy left. You're, you're, you know. So, but on the other hand, if you act locally, if you decide, well, there's something I can do in my community. I can get together with my friends and I can clean up this stream. I can collect litter. I can start some kind of uh, program to collect uh, food for the homeless, that sort of thing. And you see you make a difference. And then suddenly 
you realize that all around the world, other people are doing the same thing. Now, then you dare think globally. And uh, so if you, if you feel that what you do doesn't make a difference or what anybody does, it's too late and it won't make a difference, then what will you do? You'll do nothing. What's the point? If you think it's all hopeless, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. What's the point? And then the second kind of leg of this is how lucky I was to have an extraordinary mother when I was growing up that helped me, you know, to base some of the things I think now they were grounded when I was a small child. And she, she raised me to believe in myself. She raised me to think that I could do anything. She told me when everybody laughed at my 10 year old dream of going to Africa, living with animals and writing books about them. And they laughed at me and said, we didn't have money. World War II was raging and I was just a girl. Whereas mum said, if you really want something, you're going to have to take advantage of every opportunity and work really hard. But if you don't give up, you may find a way. And I did. So those are the two, I don't know quite how they fit in with what you asked me, Lucy, but those are the two things that cropped into my mind. And do you think, one of the theories I've got, I mean, again, I, I just think it doesn't help to have too many theories about change. Doesn't, I mean, in my experience, it's very, it's much more practical. And sometimes, and exactly as you say, sometimes a small action, that kind of grows, hope grows itself or it, it seeds itself if, you have, if you've taken an action which actually has made a change, however small that change is. One of the things I've thought about, I don't know what you think about this, is that for me, the people who've been real change makers have kind of done it because it's just very obvious to them. It hasn't really felt like a change when they did. I don't know if that's your experience when you do it. And then everybody else tells you that that's not acceptable or that you shouldn't have done it or that it's too difficult or something. Then you realize that that is, that is quite a change. But you do it because it's just really obvious to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, my childhood dream did come true, as most people know. I did get to Africa. I had to work hard. I had to work as a waitress in a hotel just around the corner there, actually. I had to do a secretarial course. We didn't have money. I had to get a job. But then, you know, invited to Kenya by a school friend. And that's where I got to meet um, Dr. Lewis Leakey, the famous paleontologist, who gave me the chance to to study chimps and uh, so so uh, it was um what was the question you asked me my mind suddenly wandered so far away in a wonderful place what did you ask me i think it's just about whether you whether you were whether you were intending to make change oh, yes. or whether you, you were just following your dream weren't you i followed my dream right. so um, Leaky gave me this opportunity to go and live with not just any animal, but the one most like us. Nobody was doing it. Nobody had done it. Um, there were basically, only about five people at that time out there studying animals in the wild, and several of them were Japanese, so we didn't know about them. Um, but what I did when I got to Gombe National Park was observe the chimps just as I had observed the squirrels and birds and things around my home here. And as I got to know them as individuals, all different own personalities. And for two years, I got gradually to learn about their family relationships and, and, and how different they all were and watch them tool using and tool making something that was supposed to be unique to us. And saw them kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another on the back. And then after two years, my mentor, Louis Leakey, who, by the way, never came to Gombe, uh, left me on my own. But anyway, he told me I had to get a degree. And there was no time, he said, to mess about with an undergraduate degree. He got me a place in Cambridge University to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology meant. I hadn't been to college. No, animal behavior, well, behavior. So imagine how I felt. I was nervous going to this erudite university and to be told by so many of these professors, I had done everything wrong. 
I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. That was scientific. I couldn't talk about personality, mind, or emotion. Those were unique to us. But I'd been taught as a child by this guy behind me. I'm going to bring him close up because it's really special. Um, this is my childhood companion, my dog, Rusty. And he taught me that the professors were wrong. And so I stuck to my, I shouldn't say stuck to my guns. We're trying to get rid of guns, aren't we? Well, anyway, <laughs> I, I hang on to my convictions. And um, because chimps are so like us biologically, sharing 98.6% of DNA and uh, behaviorally, um, I was able eventually, well, not me, the chimps were able to persuade Western science to come out of this reductionist way of thinking and realize we are part of and not separated from the rest of the animal kingdom. Mm. And, and one of the, th I mean, one of the things that religion's been so bad at, I mean, I, and I speak as a you know, public practitioner of it, is that quite often religious teaching has tried to make that separation and say that human beings are exceptional and separate and you're, you're nodding very vigorously, Mary, I feel very, uh, but I, you know, and I, I, I kind of feel, I mean, you know, here I am sitting in front of this, this carving, this Grinning Gibbons carving from the 17th century from this church. And it's a riot of creation, really. I mean, there's, a, there's an amazing pelican with her, with her babies. There's this amazing kind of flora and fauna, all kind of, uh, there, there are seashells in there. There, is, there are scallops, there are mollusks. It's an amazing um, representation of the world, uh, the natural world. And it's at the very part of the church where the kind of the sacred, you know, the Eucharist is, is celebrated. So, so there's, a, there's such a contradiction in, particularly in Christian religion, where at one moment we might say, like with this, that we're, at the, we're interdependent, we're part of the natural world, we're surrounded by these extraordinary gifts. And then on the other hand, we're, we're separate, we're exceptional. These resources are there for us to use and exploit and take out. And I mean, do, do, you, get, do you get frustrated or, or angry with, with a kind of re religion, that kind of religion? Well, Did you cross it or? not so much frustrated, angry. It's, um, it, it's the fact that there is so much ignorance and, you know, I feel part of my job is to cast some light over that ignorance. But I don't know if you know this, Lucy, but I have quite a few uh, friends, Jewish friends. Some of them are very up to date in, in the language, Hebrew. And this, in, the, in Genesis, where it talks about man being given dominion over the animals, birds, fish, etc. That was a wrong translation. The original right. word, which I can't remember, isn't dominion. It's something more like stewardship, which makes a huge difference. And so I think, I think the chimps have really helped many, many, many people to understand that there isn't this sharp division between us and them. But that is, that is something. And basically, it's Western science. I mean, you go out to Asia where you have the other faiths, the Buddhists and the, and the Hindus, and they are one with the animal kingdom. It's us, we in the West. And I think it is partly due to a kind of bigoted religion. And isn't it sad, Lucy, how, you know, if you look at all of the great religions of the world, they all have the same golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. Every single one of them has that in some form or other. And, and yet, and yet look what's happening because people become fanatical, you get religious wars, and it, it's just so tragic because at, at the base of it all, we're all one. And the, the, the teaching should be, we are all one, we are all one family. And it was again my mother, and she used to say, Jane, you, you're born into a Christian family because my, my grandfather, was a congregational minister. Sadly, I never knew him. He died before I was born, but he sounds absolutely amazing. And she said, my mother, so you were brought up as a Christian, but you might have been born in Egypt. And then you probably have been a Muslim. 
or you might have been born in India, and then maybe you'd have been a Buddhist or a Hindu. And so she said, but surely all of these religions worship a God. It must be one God. They can't be all of these gods. So the name that we give the God, whether it's Jehovah, Allah, God, or what, is the same God. We are one family worshipping one God. There's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful uh, rhythm to that to those creation stories in Genesis, which is exactly as you say, have been such so misinterpreted. And I, I was speaking to a Hebrew scholar once, and she explained to me that the rhythm, the rhythm of those on the first day and on the second day and on the third day, kind of you know, there's a rhythm to it. And what human beings have done is thought that the sixth day was the most important day because that's when human beings were created. So we've kind of put ourselves at the top of this tree. But in fact, the, the rhythm of the Hebrew takes you through the sixth day to the seventh day. So the seventh day is the kind of point of it all, which is this, um, which you know, would, in Jewish and Christian terms is, a, is the Sabbath day, which is the day where you enjoy one another and you, you are part, you're part of this extraordinary um, context of, of life and teeming with abundance um, and, and rest, you know. And there's no suggestion that God rested on the seventh day because God was tired or somehow had run out of energy. There's a kind of point towards that seventh day. And I've, I've always found that, um, when, when she explained that to me some years ago, that helped me enormously with dealing with the, with this, you know, false separation in, in the Christian tradition between matter and spirit and, and humans and the rest of creation, because it's, it's, it's not there in the text if you really allow the text to breathe and you allow, allow it to kind of interrogate your own life and your own part in creation. So maybe we can, we can try to say that a bit more. <laughs> now, what you're saying, Lucy, is precisely where we stand at this crossroads in in our whole our, our whole evolution. I mean, right now we face a future where we could go one way or the other. We after we come out of the pandemic, we face a much more serious crisis, which is climate climate change. And so there are big businesses and politicians just desperate to get back to business as usual. Business as usual is unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and a growing human population that is gradually getting wealthier and where many countries are trying to uh, reach the standard of living that we have, which means, I don't know, the end of the earth. But hopefully after this pandemic, Enough people have experienced for the first time in big cities, breathing clean air, hearing the birds sing, looking up at the stars at night and seeing them shining clear and bright and not through a haze of pollution or sometimes not seeing them at all. And that happens, has happened so many times to me in Beijing, Mumbai and so on. And so as we emerge from this pandemic, I just have to pray that there will be a groundswell of people not wanting to go back to the polluted days, but wanting to move towards a new green economy and exactly what you just said, to move into a world where we don't measure success by the amount of, of, of money and stuff and power, but on being able to have a really good life to support your family to enjoy nature, that's that's what's got to happen. And what do you think stops us, Jane? Honestly, what stops us? I mean, you know, we can say there's money and power, and but what 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 is the kind of what's the barrier that needs to be dissolved? Because what we're talking about just sounds it sounds like such a beautiful life. So why wouldn't everybody want that life? What what is it in us, human beings? that is taking us in the opposite direction, would you say? Well, I think um, people probably do want that life, even the people who don't realize they want it, actually want it. But unfortunately, because of greed and corruption, 
um, you know, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said the planet can provide the human need but not human greed. And so we've, we've moved into a materialistic society. We've cut our connection with the natural world, which is tragic because we are part of it and we depend on it for our future. And um, we've, we've moved away from a spiritual connection with the natural world, a spiritual connection with the supreme power, the creator. And so because of this, because of this lust for power, this greed, we've created the haves and the have-nots and the gaps getting wider. I mean, it was the haves and then the sort of coming up to the haves and the have-nots, but now it's just haves and have-nots really. And that creates terrible pressure on the environment because if you're very living in poverty and you're in the third world, you're out in the environment, you're going to cut down the last trees and fish the last fish because you'd have to survive and feed your family. And if you're in an urban area like, like the UK, you're going to have to buy the cheapest junk food and you can't ask, did this food harm the environment? Did it result in cruelty to animals like the factory farms? Is it cheap because of child slave labor or wages way below minimum that, that these supermarkets pay to sell food cheap and make money? And so all of this has combined to create a world of, of it's so uneven and so distorted and so, I don't know how we're going to get out of it. But if we don't, we've had it. There's a kind of mind, there's a mind change. I, I, I've been talking about heart and spirit, as you have, but I sometimes think that we, we actually convince ourselves. I do, so this is, this is back in my previous, in my previous role. I was at, uh, working at St. Paul's Cathedral, which, as you know, is a huge building. And, and we were doing something. I can't even remember what it was, but there was something that we wanted to do in one part of this vast building. And one of the members of the team said, um, yeah, but we haven't got room to do that. And we all kind of had to stop and said, you've just said we haven't got room. This is St. Paul's, we have got room to do this. And I think there's something in that where we convince ourselves that we live in a kind of scarcity you know, everything's very, everything's very scarce. Whereas in fact, and our resources of hope are actually depleted or that we, we're kind of struggling to find enough of whatever it is that we need. But in fact, what we're doing is living in a situation of kind of um, compressed um, energy or abundance. And all we have to do is not kind of, we don't have to strive and work so hard. We have to just take the lid off take the lid off it in some way or unlock it in some way. I think sometimes those actions of hope are just very tiny. They're very kind of like, you know, exactly as you were saying, it's just looking into somebody's eyes sometimes or into the eyes of creature. I look at my dog and I absolutely believe he's, he's telling me something. And, you know, he winks at me, I wink back. You know, we just, what are we, what are we doing? But actually that moment in the day, that can keep me going for hours to commune with a creature like that. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree. And this is the whole thing. We're just moving away from who we are. We're moving away into a paradigm that certain people, people I don't admire very much, have kind of orchestrated as this is the path to success. If you want to succeed, you've got to follow. I meet young people, particularly in Asia, and they come to, up to me after a lecture and they're in tears. They say, well, we desperately want to help the environment. We want to work with animals, but our parents or our teachers, they want us to go into business. They want us to make money. What should we do? So now here I'm confronted with a, with a, a difficult question. I don't want to put young people against their parents. So, so what I say to them is, well, Maybe you'd better do what your parents, your teachers suggest. Go into business, do really well. But that doesn't mean that every single day you can't be helping the environment or helping animals. You can still do both. And at a certain point, 
you can say, okay, now I've, I've done my duty, I've done business, I've made money, um, mom and dad are going to have a nice retirement. Now I'm going to just move away and work for the environment. So that's what I tell them. But, you know, it's so sad that this, this thing of making money and tragically for so many people, they have to, they have to make money. I mean, look what's happening in the pandemic in many parts of Africa, for example, people live from day to day, they live by selling on the street and that's what gives them their, their meals at night. So when they were told to, so to, um, to, to lock down, then they couldn't make money. And so they were starving. But that's the kind of world we've created. It's a, a, a terrible, terrible world. I wonder if that might be a point just, just to drop in something that's come through on the chat that, that people are asking about um, the relationship of um, grief and despair. I mean, perhaps that relates to what you're saying about suppressed abundance, um, Lucy. If we, if, we are a, if we are in despair and grieving um, as, a, as a worldwide people, what can we do about that? And, and, and can that be used to perhaps energize hope and, and life for the future? And how would we do that? Uh, I, I mean, I think this despair is, is uh, in, in, my, in my kind of lexicon, despair would be different from grief. Grief and lament um, are different from despair. But let me just talk about grief and lament for a moment. I think, I think that um, the expression of grief at the loss of the, at the, loss of, you know, the natural world or the expression of grief at, um, uh, at death, however that comes out, the, for the forces of death and the forces of of uh, kind of nihilism that say that we should not uh, rather than that we can I think those um, those are, those can be energizing I mean you know there are so many different stages of grief as, as we all know from you know from our own experiences but actually grief if it's named and expressed and given given uh, a voice as it were and in a lament, which has no point to it, except to express the grief, that can in itself, again, that mysterious unlocking mechanism, if, if it's done really thoroughly, it can unlock a, uh, a vision of the future where things don't have to be as they are. I think that that in my, in my world, that's different from despair, where um, there is a kind of grinding daily struggle to survive and either and that can be economically physically emotionally spiritually and that uh, that can be um, can be kind of dissolved or transformed by hope but that normally is, is uh, uh, in my experience is just a very slow step by step do one tiny thing and, and recognize that thing that you've done and name it. And then you can possibly find your way out of it. But despair to me is much more paralyzing than, than, a, than a deep heartfelt lament and grief, which as I said, when it, if, if it's given a name and a voice can unlock a new vision of the future. Yeah, well, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I completely agree. And I think I would personally equate despair with the loss of hope um, because if you lose hope everything is desperate and where can you go if you've lost hope how, lost how do you not despair jane you despair? yourself yourself I, me you do. well there are times when i look around the world like like i said earlier if you think globally, you can't help but be depressed. You cannot help but be depressed if you look at what's happening around the world, environmentally, socially, politically, especially today politically. I mean, look at some of the leaders we have. Just look at them. How did they get there? And how do we get rid of them? I, it, it's, it's unbelievable. But, you know, we have to keep on fighting. And how do I get away from despair or depression? Uh, Partly because I'm jolly obstinate and I'm not going to let the Donald Trumps and so forth knock me down and 
take me down. I'm jolly well going to go on fighting. So how do I get out of it? I think the best way out of despair and loss of hope is to take action, to actually do something, to prove that you actually do make a difference. You can make an impact on the environment. If you pick up trash, you can clean a whole street. If you persuade your friends to pick up trash, you can clear a whole community. And so you then get empowered. And when you get empowered, then you get hope back. And we all need hope. And without hope, you know, we really won't do anything, but it has to be a two-way thing. You lose hope, so you have to be persuaded to take action. And you take action and you get back hope. So, you know, this is why I began our youth program, Roots and Shoots, which actually began in Tanzania. And it was because I met so many young people who'd lost hope and they were angry or depressed or mostly just apathetic and seemed to care. And I asked them why they felt that way. Well, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. We have compromised their future. We've been stealing their future. We're still stealing it. But is there nothing that can be done about it? There I didn't agree with them. So Roots and Chutes is about young people choosing projects to make the world a better place for people, for animals, for the environment, and as much as possible, bring them together from different countries to realize that underneath the color of our skin, our culture, our religion, we're all one human family. And it's now in 65 countries and it's changed lives. I mean, I have letters uh, from emails from young people all over the world almost daily saying, joining Roots and Chutes changed my life. And that's, you know, it's, it's really, for me, inspiring is what keeps me going. It's what keeps me on track. Um, and I know that listening to us, Lucy, we have the Jane Goodall Institute staff in the UK and the board and all of our amazing Roots and Shoots people. And I thank them so much because they help me to keep going, you know, when I feel down. Do I ever feel down? Of course I do. How could you not? But then you've got to get up again, you know? And one poet said, I was ever a fighter, so one fight more. Browning. <laughs> there's, a, there's another comment which perhaps relates to that, that Jane, yeah, you have absolutely overcome any kind of um, paralysis you, you might have felt, but there, there's a comment about how the paralyzing effect of fear on people. So we live in, in a terrible time. And, and I think of some of my neighbors who I might try to galvanize and they're not very easily galvanizable. And there is real fear um, about what's, what is happening to us. And, and, that, and that paralyzes. I wonder um, perhaps both of you, if you could comment on, on overcoming that overcoming fear well let me let me jump in there because um i lived through world war ii and there was so much fear around i mean you can imagine bombs falling in london people you knew my uncle was killed um there was a lot of fear and i was only a child um but you know we had churchill's voice out there and whatever you think of churchill without him Britain would have been overrun by Nazi Germany. I have no hesitation in saying that. And so we overcame fear by um, this, this, again, this indomitable spirit. Okay, I'm frightened, but I'm going to fight. And if you really pull yourself together and you say, I'm going to go and fight this foe, then fear must be suppressed or you can't take action. Something like that, <laughs> Lucy. Yes, I think um, I think that um, one of the difficulties with handling fear is that somehow we believe that other people don't feel it, uh, and so we should be more like them. And so when we do feel it, that we we elapse, we kind of feel that we're somehow a failure. But I, I think that the most courageous people feel fear, of course. Fear is a natural thing. And sometimes fear is a, is a good thing, isn't it? If, if we're in danger, fear can sometimes 
yeah. of course it paralyzes you but actually it can actually it can get you to recognize the danger that you're in so it can also be energizing i suppose my my sense is I, i've been very afraid sometimes i've been afraid you know occasionally for my life i've visited i've visited places like uh, syria where um where there were moments where I thought, I, I, I think I may be in actual mortal danger here. But um, mostly the fear that I've felt has been fear um, of, I, I've never regretted doing something. I've often regretted not doing something. So if, if I just don't know if my legs are gonna carry me forward to the next thing that I'm very afraid of, then, uh, acknowledging that I'm afraid is a really important step to make me to take to make me move because if if I just think well I shouldn't be feeling this I should be feeling all gung-ho and courageous and I'm not I just think that's false I, I feel very fearful sometimes and then you step forward anyway so you it, it's a paradox I suppose it's a paradox but that's not to say that fear doesn't sometimes overwhelm us and overtake us and I think in this pandemic that has been a, that has been a real uh, difficulty for many people and that the issue in this particular situation I think has been it's been very hard because the point the point of it has been to stay isolated from each other the point of it has been to keep away from each other and we found ways to connect online for example but I think that's been that's been particularly tricky um, because if you're in another type of fearful situation you can all huddle together you can get together and perhaps sing or or you know, circle the wagons metaphorically and kind of get get together with others. In this one, we've we've actually the point of it has been to keep us apart, and that's been very isolating and and fearful for many people. I think. Yeah, and didn't you love like in Italy when they were isolated, they all came out in their balconies <laughs> and sang opera and things like that. You know, these ways of overcoming fear and loneliness. Um, I think that's. That, that was a really important part of what happened during this pandemic. But I think maybe at this point, I have to say, we brought this pandemic on ourselves. The people studying these zoonotic diseases where a pathogen jumps from an animal to a person, maybe creates a new disease, maybe a new disease that's contagious like COVID-19. Um, they've been predicting this for a long, long time. We've had so many of these zoonotic diseases. And it's because A, we disrespect nature, we destroy habitats, we put animals in closer contact, drive them into closer contact with people, um, creating situations where a pathogen, pathogen can jump from an animal to a person. And then we disrespect the animals. We hunt them, we, we kill them, we eat them, we traffic them, we sell their dismembered bodies in the in the bushmeat markets of Africa, in the wet, wet, the, the, not the wet markets, the um, wildlife markets in Asia, but also in our factory farms. So many diseases have jumped from animals in these, these factory farms have been called the concentration camps for animals, and they are, you've seen them. It, it, it's horrific. And of course it creates situations where a pathogen can jump to a human because of the unhygienic conditions there and in the uh, wildlife meat markets and in the bush, mar bush meat markets. And, you know, people are blaming China. Well, HIV AIDS came from chimpanzee meat in Africa and the bush meat markets in Central Africa and Ebola also probably from gorillas and MERS, whatever that means, uh, came from domestic camels in the Middle East. So it's not just Asia. We're guilty everywhere. We're guilty everywhere because of our disrespect leading to the pandemic that has caused the fear and which right now is challenging us. Will we emerge from the pandemic and create a better relationship with the natural world and animals? Or will we just give in to the powers that be and go on with business as usual leading to the end of life on Earth as we know it, I think. Not saying that there won't be a life in another world, but this world.
how do how do we do that? What's what's the paradigm shift? So we started this conversation with um, the the really genuine paradigm shift that you launched, Jane, with with helping us see that that we are just another animal in on not just, but we are a part of the natural world. Um, Lucy, you said to me the other day, um, uh, women doing theology relinquish this idea of a of an overall theory of everything and it becomes much more contextualized and uh, and relational perhaps. So these are big these are big shifts and yet a lot of the world haven't hasn't made this shift. What's the big shift you think we need now in our thinking to to avoid that scenario that you've just described, Jane? What is it that we're we're doing that's not helpful, that's damaging? Well I think we've already said it, haven't we? Um, don't you think we've said it? We've said we need a new way of uh, relating to the natural world. We need a new way of thinking about what is a successful life. We need a way that says, no, it's not accumulating wealth and stuff and power. It's about leading a satisfying and a good life. Good, sometimes good, goody, goody, it gets a sort of, but good is a good word. And we need to lead the good life a life that can make us content and happy with time to, as they say, smell the flowers, and listen to the birds, and, you know, a life where we can support our loved ones, where we can reach out and help those who are less fortunate, because the more you help, the better you feel. And I've actually been told, I was actually told when I was talking about altruism in chimpanzees, um, well, if an act of altruism makes you feel better, is it altruistic? <laughs> that's, to me, it's such a stupid question, but that's what I ask. That's the way people think. Mm -hmm. Lucy. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think that's wonderful. If somebody said that I to you. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I, I guess I would, I think we have to, so for me, the paradigm shift is Yes it's, yes, it's global, but actually, you know, it's within every human heart. That's the paradigm shift that, that, uh, that is required. And it's a movement away from um, a competitive, fearful attitude towards one another and the natural world, um, towards a, a, as Jane was saying, an altruistic and empathetic uh, view of, of others. Um, and I think that also there, there's a kind of theological question in this, which is um, what we think is enough. You, you, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole theology of, of enough. When do you know that you have enough stuff or enough food or enough uh, possessions? And the, the kind of ability to be content with enough, which is nearly always less than you think it is, um, doesn't mean to say that we're asking one another to live in a colder, darker world at all. It means that the, the abundance that we're surrounded with is more equitably shared. Now, the difficulty with that is that what happens when you, uh, I mean, Jane's mentioned the Second World War, what happens when there is a, there is a, uh, a system and an ideology that overtakes enough people for that to be imposed on uh, or to be attempted to be imposed on the rest of the world that has to be resisted. So I don't, I don't think that there's any, I'm, I'm not trying to describe some kind of Pollyanna-ish, you know, unrealistic place. I think that within each human heart, we know what it's like to want to exploit or to want to be selfish or to, to kind of push against something that we don't like. We know what that's like. So the paradigm shift is, is actually within our grasp as individuals, it seems to me. And, and the way that we humans share that is to talk about it. So I think good conversation combined with small actions and a kind of a paradigm shift inside us to decide to live a hopeful life um, is is part of the this mystery, and I do want to go back to it. It is quite mysterious how this how this shift can happen, um, and I think we we sometimes convince ourselves that we just haven't worked hard enough and we haven't done enough 
you know, working and uh, campaigning and talking in, in order to make the change. That, that is, we're always going to strive to do that, but actually there's something a bit more gentle which can happen inside us where we simply say, um, I mean, it was the French philosopher Albert Camus, he's one of my favourite quotations, which was, I would rather live my life believing in God and die to find out that I'm wrong than live my life not believing in God and die to find out that I'm right. So he didn't know, of course, uh, nobody knows, but he just thought, I'm going to live in, I am going to live in this way. I'm going to choose to live in this way. And being right isn't the most important thing. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> that's right. And now, to start off, let me say, I feel I was incredibly lucky growing up in, in the war because we took nothing for granted. We didn't take life, continuation of life for granted. Bombs can drop any time. In fact, I, me and my sister were very nearly finished off with a bomb. Um, Every, you know, I think the rationing, we got like one square of chocolate a week, something like that. Uh, food was rationed, clothes were rationed, everything was rationed. And um, so you didn't take things for granted. Now, young people today in our society, they take things for granted, but it's not their fault because they've always been surrounded with it. So if they want to buy another outfit because they can't wear the one they wore yesterday, tomorrow, then... I, other other young people are feeling exactly the same. So sometimes, you know, people have said what we need is another war. Well, I know what they mean. Of course, we don't want another war, although it kind of has been looming, hasn't it? But um, going into what you were talking about, Lucy, about death and God, um, I was asked at a lecture the other day, uh, Jane, what's your next adventure? So I thought for a moment, I mean, I was already over 80. And um, the adventures I dreamed of when I was younger are not on my bucket list anymore because I wouldn't be able to climb in some of those um, dangerous places where I used to yearn to go. I said, well, actually, dying. And there was a kind of gasp. There were about 5,000 people in the, in the auditorium. And there was this dead silence, a few nervous titters. And I said, well, you know, when you die, there's either nothing, in which case that's it, or there's something. And I said, I happen to believe there's something. And if there is, can you think of a greater adventure than finding out what that something is? So um, I'm not sure that this really is answering any question, but what you said made me think of that. And uh, it is something. And, and so many people have come up to me and said, Jane, I never like to think about dying, but now I think about it completely differently and I want to thank you. So I think what we're afraid of isn't dying. It isn't death rather, but it's the process of dying because that can be awful. And of course we fear that. And read it really you know I mean I don't know how many but you must have seen many people dying horrible deaths I have too um, and people just have to get through it and I, I think I would even go so far as to say for me I don't know whether I can quite say this quite so absolutely but all perhaps all fear finds its root in a fear dying because we can't imagine we, we find it very difficult to imagine ourselves not not being here every i mean everyone listening to this everyone on this call will die that's something we all have in common and i find that very i find that comforting it's only a matter of timing it, it's, it's not a matter of avoiding it altogether and that and that, so that, and that quest, you know, down that way lies folly. But I think at the root of that fear of dying lies sometimes our fear of silence. We, we create a very noisy world and a world where the lights are on all the time. And I think that's a kind of mini fear of silence, which is uh, a moment that reminds us that one day we will 
fall silent completely. So to make our peace with that journey and that adventure, as you call it, I think is, um, would, 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 give us, would give us a greater degree of peace than we can um, ima imagine, actually. But it, may, it may not be silent. What about the music of the spheres? Yes. We don't know, do we? Yeah, we just that's right. don't know yeah. what's going to happen. And so, you know, for me, as I say, it, it, it's, a, it's a great adventure. But then the silence, what I have always loved best is to be out in the rainforest by myself. Now, it's not mostly not silent, but some people think it's silent. They come out and they say it's silent. There's birds singing and insects humming and, and the wind rustling through the leaves. But the tragedy is that because of the way we're where our, our onslaught on Mother Nature is it's getting more and more and more silent. And we're causing that. So when I was a child here, and I realized it's getting dark, I may slip off and put a light on in a minute. But um, when I was growing up every morning, there was a dawn chorus. I used to wake myself up at four to hear the dawn chorus of the birds. It's two or three now, it, it, it's gone. And that's our pesticides and our you know, our, our sanitizing of nature, and it's tragic. We're creating silence. Mm. So there's a, a good silence and a not so good silence, perhaps. Yeah. So we're, we're drawing near the end of our time, but I wonder if, if each of you would like to, um, I'll just wait till Jane comes back from the light switch. There we go. I am, there and I can see me again. You're very bright now. I was going down. I wasn't looking at myself. <laughs> I just wondered whether each of you would like to ask the other um, one burning question. What would you really like to know about each other's lives or work or inspiration or what keeps you going? Okay, Lucy, I'll start this time because you had to start the first one. <laughs> um, this apparent a conflict between science and religion. Where do you stand on that? How do you, how do you reconcile those two, what people think are different? In my experience, I think that both, um, both sides, as it were, and I'm gonna come on to say that I don't think they are two sides, but for now, both sides, um, make up what the other one thinks in order to reject it. So sometimes there's a bit of a false argument going on where um, uh, the scientific establishment might say, well, the God, the God that is, the God that that religion believes in is clearly nonsense for these reasons. And sometimes religious people kind of throw accusations at science um, that, that and kind of sets up a straw man, as it were. In my experience, as listening to science, and I'm not a scientist myself, as is very plain, but in listening to in listening to scientists like you and others, I don't hear. I just don't hear the conflict. I can't find it. Uh, if a person, if a person is discovering more and more about, for example, the natural world or the cosmos or a particle or a anything that is uh, that is a kind of a, a, a trajectory of discovery for me, as a person who believes in God, that's simply discovering more of what has been created. So I, I I can't quite find it in myself to even even remember what the conflict is. I don't think maybe r rather than you asking me a question, we should carry on with this one because it's so important and. You know, I think you're absolutely right. I know that my mother and Dr. Lewis Leakey both felt there was absolutely no conflict between science and religion. And remember, I didn't start as a scientist. I wanted to go and live with animals. I wanted to be a naturalist and write books. But what's fascinated me recently is some of the very, very top intellectual scientists and physicists and uh, so on have come to believe in intelligence behind the universe. 
And I find this, it, it's like, you know, it's, it's like substantiating everything I've always believed. And one of the best examples, and if you haven't read this book, Lucy, I'm going to recommend it to you. Um, it's the man who's right now head of National Institute of Health in the USA. He's having a terrible time because of the pandemic, but um, he's, he's a geneticist. And he's the one who, with his team, unraveled the human genome. And I've become very good friends with him. And he said, you know, Jane, when I began, I was not an atheist, but I was an agnostic. I, I didn't really think much about it. But as I started contemplating the wonder of every single human cell and everything that makes up that cell and how one cell is given the uh, genetic code, you're going to be a toenail, you're going to be part of a kidney, you're going to be a bit of a brain. This isn't chance. This isn't some evolutionary chance throwing together of um, particles in a, in, a, in a chaos. And so he's ended up deeply religious. And I know there are many other scientists, particularly physicists, who've come to exactly the same conclusion. And I find this wonderful because it substantiates what you were saying, Lucy. It substantiates what my mother and Louis Leakey always said. And so science and, and religion are coming back together. And I'm so happy it's happened in our lifetime. I mean, it's exciting. It's, it's like a whole new world. And we need this kind of thing if we're going to get through this pandemic to create the new world, to create the new green economy, to create a new picture of what the good life is, a new measure of success, and somehow get rid of all these people who are pushing us down a path to destruction. I don't know how to get rid of them. I'd, I'd like to put them all in a big spaceship and send them off into outer space. But Perhaps that's, the new, perhaps that's the new paradigm we were looking for, the coming back together of science and religion to, to make something holistic. Um, we, do, we don't have much time. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, no, um, carry on if you're speaking. Well, I, I, I did actually, I mean, this, this, may, this may, it's a bit more specific, but this, this may open it up in, you know, another area of this, because I, I'm so fascinated by your, you know, insistence that, um, that chimps have culture. And I've, I've, I've read, you know, as much as I, as I can and understand, you know, what you've written about that. I'm, I'm really interested to know whether chimps have, in your view, would, would they organize themselves into any kind of religion or would that, and is there a kind of belief system by which I mean, not a kind of doctrinal belief, but a kind of, you know, you know, the word credo in Latin, uh, to, to believe, it comes from two words which don't mean intellectual proposition. They, it actually means to give over my heart. So belie belief, whenever it's translated, should, much, should be much more about trust, really, than about a kind of set of doctrinal beliefs. Do you observe that in, in chimpanzees, that there is a kind of instinct to worship even or pray? Or, yeah. Well, I think um, I first have to preface this by saying that the biggest difference between them and us is this explosive development of the intellect. I mean, we now know that, that chimpanzees and pigs and dogs and dolphins and even the octopus and birds, crows, they're way, way, way more intelligent than science used to admit, way more. But we designed a rocket that went up to Mars and a little robot came off, took photographs. I mean, we're, our intellect is on a different scale. We win this pandemic. I don't know where we'd be if we didn't have this way of communicating around the globe. It sort of made a huge difference. And I personally think that this intellect, the development of the intellect was at least in part triggered by the fact that at some point along our evolutionary journey, we hit upon communicating with words. So chimpanzees can be taught sign language. They can learn up to you know, 400 signs of a human sign language and use computers and things, but it still isn't the kind of, the, the language that they communicate with, just posture, gesture. Um, they can't 
teach their children about anything that isn't there. The culture is passed on because the young ones watch and imitate, but they can't tell their young ones about a culture on the other side of the lake. And they can't get together and bring chimpanzees with different experiences into one room to try and solve a problem from their different perspectives. And so this language, I think, has pushed us into that direction. So now coming back to your question, there is, there are in Gombe some incredible waterfalls. It's a Gombe is a series of steep valleys coming down to the lake shore. And in some of these valleys, well, all of them have little streams. And in some of them, the, the stream falls over a rocky cliff. And this particular one, the Casacela Falls, uh, drops 80 feet onto a rocky stream bed. It's a very shallow stream and it's very gravelly. And as you approach up the valley, you hear the roar of the water. And when you get there, the vines at the side of this fall, it's created a it's created a cleft in the rock over the hundreds and hundreds of years. And sometimes when the chimpanzees, usually the males, approach, you see their hair stand on end. And as they get there, normally they avoid treading in the water, but they're now standing in the water. It's only about this deep and they're swaying from foot to foot. And sometimes they pick up big rocks and throw them. And sometimes they're making the deep Ooh, 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 ooh. And sometimes they climb up the vines beside the waterfall and swing out into the spray. And if you're lucky at the end, these displays may last more than 10 minutes. You see them sitting on a rock. You see them looking up. And the water is coming down. And you see their eyes following it. And if they could speak, could they might they say, what is this stuff? It's always coming, it's always going, but it's always here. And might not that lead, if they could discuss it with each other, which they can't, to an animistic religion, the early religion uh, that worshiped the sun and the water and all those amazing phenomena that early humans couldn't understand. I think so, I think that is, is the root, and the word I would use to describe that root is awe. Mm. Right. Awe of the unknown. And that's really what religion is, because mm. none of us know. No. None of us know. Well, perhaps perhaps awe is a, is a fantastic word to end on for um, for this discussion about our hope-filled tomorrow. There's a whole other meeting in there, I think. So we'll be getting together again, will we? <laughs> Science, religion, um, and uh, the natural world. Can I just say a huge thank you to both of you for your lives work, for your willingness to share that, for your articulate um, ability to communicate. Um, and really it's been, it's been totally fantastic. Um, and for everybody who's watching, if you'd like to support this, please do go to the Eventbrite um, and uh, give us a little bit of money. That would be that would be fantastic. Um, thank I you very much. I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my team, my JJ <laughs> and Roots and Tube team. I wouldn't be here. I couldn't do it alone. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. I think Lucy might say the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. And I think, um, Lucy, you're going to sign us off. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I think I'm in, I'm a, I'm the technological person, which yes. anyone who knows me knows how ridiculous that is, but I'm, I'm going to stop the live stream now. Um, so thank you to Deborah and, and Jane, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you. Lovely talking to you and thank yeah. you Deborah, too.